Us Beatles collectors are a tough crowd to please. Ever since this album's original release 51 years ago, we've grown old on a steady stream of bootlegs which documented nearly every second of this enigmatic project. We've had it on every kind of format, from rough-sounding vinyl in plain white covers, home-copied cassettes, fancy-looking CDs, and have ended up with multiple digital download files on our computers. The monumental task facing Apple when putting the set together was not what to include, but what to leave out. So, was it worth the wait, or is it too little, too late? I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and welcome to this review of the 2021 Let It Be box set. In this video, I'll be reviewing both the CD and the vinyl editions. I'll first take a close look at the packaging, followed by the musical content, and then last but not least, the sound quality. A few days before the set's release on October the 15th, I ran a poll on our YouTube channel's community page, asking which format of the box set folks had ordered. We had over 1,200 responses, and these were the results. 29% said that they were getting the CD set. 35% said they were getting the vinyl. But the surprising thing was that 36% said they weren't getting anything at all. So despite years of shouting at Apple to release this project, there are still a lot of people who are unconvinced or unsure about buying this set. So why is that? Well, firstly, there's a hardcore group of fans who have spent a lot of time and money over the years listening to and acquiring every minute of these sessions. So apart from some sound quality upgrades, they don't see much point in buying this set. Secondly, it's a lot of fans, dare I say it, least favourite Beatles album. And from the comments I've received, many are happy with either their original or 2009 copies. But of course, there are a lot of fans who are going to buy anything new the Beatles put out, myself included. I was never a bootleg collector. And whilst I've heard some of the tracks on this, I've certainly never sat through every Nagra reel from these sessions. In fact, I consciously avoided it. And in a way, I'm happy not to have heard everything. There's still things for me to discover. And it was for that reason that I was looking forward to these sets. So here are the vinyl and the CD sets. As you know, if you're a regular viewer to this channel, I'm a bit of a vinyl junkie and I don't listen to CDs very much at all and it was against my nature buying the White Album box on CD. But really, I had no choice. It was the only way to get everything. The vinyl version just didn't include all the tracks that were on the CD set. This time, however, the door has swung the other way, maybe as a response to complaints from vinyl buyers, for everything which is on the CD set is included on the vinyl set, or vice versa, which leads me to my first gripe. Whereas the set's contents fits beautifully onto the five discs of the vinyl box, buyers of the CD set could be forgiven for feeling a bit cheated. None of these discs runs over 43 minutes, and it doesn't take much to work out that the 175 minutes of the entire set could have been fitted onto three CDs. Anyway, let's dive in and have a look first at one of the most important aspects of any box set. Apart from the obvious size difference, the main difference between them is that the CD box has a matte finish, whereas the vinyl set is glossy. And that finish carries over onto the cover of the books too. The vinyl book has the four portraits from the back of the album cover on its rear cover. All you've got is the Apple and Universal logos and a serial number on the back of the CD book. Those four pictures are used instead on the folder which houses the CDs. Here's another odd switch. The pages in the CD book have a nice semi-gloss finish to them, which enhances the photographic content nicely. The vinyl book uses a rougher matte paper, which to me feels cheaper and doesn't look as good. Although they contain the same content, the books are not identical. There are subtle differences in layout. And of course, the text had to be adapted when mentioning the track and disc numbers for the songs being discussed. I'm also not a big fan of designer Darren Evans' scrapbook style of layout. The layout, I think, also wastes too much space and makes the text in the CD book smaller than it needed to be. For me, the ideal book would have been the glossy cover from the vinyl with the paper from the CD book. I don't yet have the Get Back book, 
but from what I've seen of it from others who've kindly shared it online, it looks to be a spectacular piece and is on my shopping list. So with all that out of the way, let's now move on to the albums themselves. The vinyl set contains five separate discs. The original album, the Glyn Johns mix album, a double gatefold album containing the sessions, rehearsals and jams, and a four track 12 inch 45 RPM EP. The LPs all look great with strong glossy covers, although the EP cover is a little unimaginative. All of the discs in this set were pressed by Optimal in Germany and weigh an average of 187 grams, with the Glyn Johns disc in this set being a healthy 204. Looking at the disc itself, Apple can't seem to decide what to do with its label design. The original Apple label was beautiful, but reproducing that look since has been problematic and they've clearly lost the original artwork. The 2009 label looked like this, which although not as good as the original, is much better than this one. The original US album had a red Apple label and it would have been nice if one of the vinyl discs had been given a red label too. However, it does appear in red on the Blu-ray disc. As I mentioned in my unboxing video, the cover of the Let It Be album has had a few subtle changes made to it. Firstly, a small detail is that the font used in the title on the front panel is different. The original used a font called Chantilly Serial Heavy, but on the new set, they've gone for one called Futura Extra Bold. I'm not sure why it was changed. Reasons for that may have been that they either couldn't get the rights for it or couldn't find the original font or typeface. Another reason might have been is that the original, being metal typeset, simply doesn't exist in the open type computer font world. The photos on the front cover have also undergone a good deal of work. This is very clear to see when you compare it to the ones on the original UK cover, and especially those used on the original box set. It seems that photo or film grain has become the new tape noise, and a lot of effort is now being made to remove it from the contemporary scene. My hope is that Peter Jackson's film will keep some of that in and won't be as smeary and smooth as the recent YouTube trailer. Without doubt, the best looking thing in this set and the biggest attraction for collectors is the official release of the Glyn Johns mix, housed in the cover it was to originally have appeared in. After so many years of seeing this as a bootleg or fantasy item, it's amazing to actually have this cover in your hands. It's so odd, in fact, that it's difficult to believe that it's not a bootleg. The image used on the front looks like the one used on the front of the 1967-70 album, but as you might be able to see, they are subtly different. The folder containing the CDs shows yet another different shot. Talking of the CD set, let's have a look at its contents. Whilst the LP covers are glossy, heavy and feel great in the hand, the CD covers are very thin and just not up to the quality I expected. Although I wasn't expecting something up to the quality of the 2009 mono set with its flip back covers and repro inners, it would have been nice to have some inners in these CDs, which the Japanese pressing of this set has. I remember people complaining about the digipacks in the 2009 set, but compared to these, this is a work of art. These unlaminated matte covers feel very cheap and flimsy, and like the folder itself, still have artifacts around the edges where they were separated. I do feel for those who didn't or couldn't get the vinyl set. What would you prefer, this or this? No wonder there are many crying out for a standalone release of this album. But to be honest, I can't see that happening, for the simple reason being that it's collector quality and not legacy quality. Unlike fans and collectors, the casual buyer wouldn't understand or be happy with the content of this album, which is, after all, why it wasn't released in the first place. The main reason I can see for getting the CD set is for the Blu-ray disc, which incidentally is audio only. Unfortunately for me, I don't have the equipment to get the full benefit of the 5.1 or Atmos content on it. However, I did listen to the two-channel PCM audio through my player and it sounded fantastic. But like with the CDs, there should have been more content on this. Finally, in this content section, I'm not entirely sure what the point of the four-track EP is. I can only assume that the space it occupies in the set was originally going to be for the rooftop concert disc, which I hope is something we'll get when the movie comes out next month. So what do the albums sound like and which are the outstanding tracks? 
Giles Martin's work on Sgt. Pepper, The White Album and Abbey Road has divided the Beatles community. So there was understandable trepidation about what approach he and his engineering colleague Sam Oakle were going to take with this album. In the end, they appear to have chosen a more conservative path and have pitched this mix between the stripped back vibe of Let It Be Naked and the spectorial excess of the original. For reference before diving into this set, I listened to this original UK 2U2U first pressing from 1970. It's always been my favourite sounding pressing of this album. It's warm, rich, and although lacking some mid-range punch, it sets up my ears for listening to the new mix. By contrast, the original US bell sound cutting was a poor sounding disc, and I think anything will be an improvement on that. Let's go through the album's tracks and see how the new remix fares against the original. Giles' trademark bass boost is in evidence throughout, and I think it spoils the charm of the opener two of us by making Ringo's kick drum too thumpy. Paul's bass was always big on their live recordings. Just listen to it on some of the BBC sessions, and its presence is really felt here on this album's live tracks, but in a good way. John admitted that they never got the recording of Across the Universe right, saying it was a lousy track of a great song. The remix presented here is less congested than the original, but it isn't the best mix of this song on the set. I Me Mine is another track which I don't think works as well on the remix mainly because George's guitar lacks some of the bite of the original mix. But it's Paul's hallmark tracks which are the most improved in this set. The remix Let It Be sounds wonderful, but The Long and Winding Road is a triumph. Spectre's decision to add the strings on the track was a good one, but the original mix emphasised them too much. Giles pulls Paul's vocals out of the mire and turns down the orchestra to just the right level where it complements the song rather than dominating it. Unfortunately though, nothing can be done for John's atrocious bass playing. I would have loved to hear how McCartney would have sounded on these tracks. Talking of musicianship, Paul, George, Ringo and Billy Preston's playing throughout this set is extraordinary. John's contributions were okay as far as they went, but overall he was distracted and disinterested in the project and simply hadn't prepared enough new material for the sessions. Giles Martin describes the album as being like a married couple trying to ignite the spark of their relationship again, but it was clearly never going to work as planned if one of the parties wasn't pulling their weight. Giles and Sam's conservative approach to remixing this album was I think the right one. And whilst it doesn't replace the original, I like it more than his previous remixes, and I will be revisiting this one more than the others. Now let's turn to what I think is the most important part of this set, the Glyn Johns disc. I'd heard most of the tracks randomly over the years, but really enjoyed hearing it all as a complete piece. It's easy to see why it was rejected, but I was surprised how dynamic it was. Although the sequencing is all over the place, I love the live transition from Dig a Pony into I've Got a Feeling. They were originally designed to be played that way, and it's a shame that the sequence wasn't repeated on the released album. The performance of The Long and Winding Road on this album is every bit as good as the remix on the main album, just without the strings. Don't Let Me Down is another highlight too. But in a late piece of news, it's just been discovered that the version of the Glyn Johns mix on the Japanese SHM Super High Material CD box set contains some different mixes than those on the set which is available everywhere else. It appears that the Japanese set uses a complete true 1969 mix of this album, whereas everybody else's contains tracks or pieces of tracks which were sourced from both the 1969 and 1970 mixes. There are also some speed differences between the tracks too. Why Apple have done this is a mystery, but it's not the first time they've messed up with mixes on Beatles box sets. I think it's high time Apple consulted the Beatle community more widely when putting these box sets together. After all, it's us who are their core market. Situations like this just make you feel a bit cheated especially if you haven't got the extra $200 to spend on buying a Japanese set. But that said, this disc is the real highlight of this set and well worth getting the vinyl box just for this album. Another highlight of this set is the previously unreleased stripped down mix of Across the Universe on the EP disc. The Indian vibe and delicate backing vocals I think suits it better than Spectre's choirs and strings. However, there's something going on in the left channel of I Me Mine on this EP. Whether it's artefacts of digital noise, I don't know, but whatever it is, it shouldn't be there. I would have liked to have heard the original UK mono mix of Don't Let Me Down on this EP, 
but the new stereo mix presented here is superb, as is Let It Be, both of which benefit from the increased dynamics of the 45 RPM format. No matter how many sessions, rehearsals and jams were included in this set, it was never going to be enough to satisfy everybody. I love hearing these intimate recordings, snippets of conversations and things which might have been. They really bring you inside the project. Gems like George working out All Things Must Pass and helping Ringo with Octopus's Garden are wonderful. The biggest revelation for me on this disc was Billy Preston's track Without a Song. What a great musician he was and his contribution to the project really saved it from disaster. Complaints about there being no rooftop concert disc will hopefully become null and void after the film is released, so I don't see that as a valid criticism of this set. I'm happy with the vinyl set, but would feel a bit hard done by if I just had the CD set, especially if I didn't have a Blu-ray player. But these sets, like most things in life, are about expectations. It's disappointment for those who wanted more, but for most fans and me, it's enough for now. And with Peter Jackson's film series just around the corner, it increases the excitement for that event. I don't see this set as rewriting history, just polishing and freshening it up. In my view, Giles and his team have succeeded in improving the Let It Be album, making it more listenable and fun. But that's just my opinion. Let me know what you think about this set in the comments. But the best thing is, is that it's not all over yet. We've still got six hours of film to look forward to next month, so I'm not putting this on the shelf just yet. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be back next week with another video which looks something like this.